Hello, and welcome to the Why We Argue podcast. I'm Robert Talese, your host. I'm professor of philosophy at Vanderbilt University. Why We Argue is produced by Humility and Conviction in Public Life, a project based at the University of Connecticut, which explores how to balance our deepest commitments with open-mindedness, a respect for reason, and intellectual humility. The series, which is made possible by generous funding from the John Templeton Foundation, features brief discussions with publicly-minded thinkers about the state of civil discourse in contemporary democracy. Today, my guest is Akhil Bilgrami. Akhil is the Sidney Morgan Besser Professor of Philosophy and a faculty member of the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. Akhil's research spans issues in philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, moral philosophy, and political philosophy. His most recent book is titled Secularism, Identity, and Enchantment. He is also the author of the forthcoming book, What is a Muslim? Hello, Akhil. Hello. How are you doing today? Fine, thanks. Great. So, Akhil, Many think that the country, the United States, is uncommonly politically polarized today, and arguably the divisions largely track religious and ethnic identities. Now, it's, it's long been a challenge for modern democracy and its theorists to bring together a diverse population into a proper, maybe unified, citizenry in a way that respects their differences, the differences of the individual citizens, while also giving due acknowledgement to the fact that in a democracy, as John Rawls put it, we share each other's fate. Now, I take it that this standing challenge is formidable even under the best social and political circumstances. And the present circumstances are arguably far from favorable. There's a growing pressure, I think, to conceive of ethnic and religious identities as exclusive in the following sense. Many see their identity as bound up with a refusal to share the social fate of others, particularly uh, those others who embody different uh, social, religious, ethnic identities, or at least certain of these identities. Accordingly, um, It seems that maybe the very idea of a democratic people, of a democratic citizenry, uh, is being transformed or perhaps jeopardized. Um, What do you think we should make of this? Well, you know, Bob, I think that we first should look at it historically a bit and then try and analyze the situation in America and other places. Great. Um, the, the problem you're describing really emerged uh, as a result of the destruction of, of relatively unselfconscious, pluralistic ways of life in Europe, uh, as a result of nation building that emerged after the Westphalian peace in Europe in the middle of the 17th century onwards. Uh, you know, uh, the idea of a nation emerged in that period for the first time, and much of the nation building that occurred in Europe uh, was a result of a very self-conscious strategy in which uh, these territories that had newly become nations uh, found an external enemy within and despised it and subjugated it and said, the nation is ours, not theirs. And that was the the beginning of nation building uh, since the Westphalian peace. Much later it came to be called nationalism. And after numerical forms of discourse and statistics became part of the, the tools by which to study society, it began to be called majoritarianism because you, you've got these notions of majority and minority analyzing societies, and it began to be majoritarianism uh, as a way of nation building, of, of, uh, as I said, pointing out, the majority pointing out that the nation is ours, and often the the majorities were religious majorities, so this, you know, the the despised minorities were Jews or the Irish or the Protestants in Catholic countries or the Catholics in Protestant countries, and that's Europe, that's the history of Europe, it's the history of of nations as they emerged in Europe. 
So it's a very long-standing history. And of course, one focuses on the very apocalyptic a uh, spectacular case of Germany in the 1930s and 40s, but it's really a very long-standing history. And a yep. great de- sorry, go ahead. No, no, please continue. So a, a, a lot of these uh, notions of secularism and so on emerged in order to repair the damage caused by this form of nationalism or nation building. Uh, so for instance, when there was this religious majoritarianism that began to construct nations along these methods, there were obviously minoritarian religious backlashes to it. And as a result, it began to be thought that religion itself was the problem. Even though it started with religious majoritarianism, because there were minoritarian backlashes to it, the civil strife caused a lot of damage, and it was to repair that damage with that history that the notion of secularism emerged in Europe. And and I think the way to understand the loss of pluralism, the loss of people living side by side completely unselfconsciously, is to understand this history of nationalism, which is now being replayed in different parts of the world, especially Europe, and including my country, India. Right. And so one of the uh, implications of the the history that you've just summarized very nicely um, is that the idea of a religiously or perhaps even ethnically pluralistic state um, has become challenged in a certain way. Uh, we see this particularly in the United States today, but also, um, I'm, I'm sad to say, throughout uh, Europe, Um, with declarations that, uh, as you had just put it, uh, the country, the nation, belongs to us, uh, where the us is identified uh, as an ethnic, some combination of ethnic and religious identity, um, as a way of um, uh, declaring that uh, the country, the state, the nation, does not belong to others who, in fact, inhabit it, and have inhabited it peacefully and dutifully uh, for generations. Is that right? That's right. But now, <clears throat> I think we need to to try and identify the similarities and the differences between a country like the United States and and Europe. Uh, uh, you see, in the United the United States is a country which is a secular secularist country, but it's not very secularized. And I think we need to make a really clean, relatively clean distinction between secularism and secularization. Secularization is really a process that that Max Weber first talked about, and it's the loss of belief in God and in creation myths and in and the loss of of religious ritual and practice. Um, secularism is a completely different idea. It's a much more specific notion. It's the idea of keeping religion out of the orbit of the polity. Uh, And that is a quite different idea from the idea of of losing uh, belief in in religion and and ceasing to have religious uh, practices and rituals. So so it's perfectly possible for a country to be highly uh, non-secularized as America is, because there's still, you know, a, a great deal of religious belief, church going, which there isn't in Europe. I, I was in a church in, in Paris on a Sunday, and there were three people in it. Uh, right, they're they're more like historical um, yeah. and, and museum-like uh, uh, structures. Exactly. So so uh, so America is not secularized, but it's a secularist country. Right. So, uh, and, and Iran is neither secularized nor secularist. Uh, now, what is interesting is that, you, I mean, one question you might ask is, why is Europe so different from America in this respect? That is, that there's almost no religious belief and practice of, that, of the kind that there is in a country like the United States. And I think the answer is that in Europe, um, the human urge for solidarity and community 
for over a century and century and a half almost by now, came from the rise of, of social democracy and labor politics. People, the, the, the emergence of unions, trade unions and union halls and so on, gave people a place to go to uh, for community and solidarity. And, and that is a very deep part of European history of the last uh, century or more. And it's an interesting thing that in, in England, for instance, it came out of religious nonconformism. Labor movements came out of religious nonconformism. Um, so it isn't as if religion had no role to play in the rise of, of social democracy. It had a very big role to play um, in Europe. But, but the urge which we all have uh, as human beings for, uh, for communal relations, for, for uh, community and, and feelings of solidarity and fraternity, uh, came from the church. Uh, for for centuries, but were replaced in Europe by a really strong social democratic labor uh, source of community. That never really caught on in, in the United States, and it's especially weak now, and as a result, church going and so on is really, the statistics of that are amazing, especially in the heartland. And uh, so that's one major difference between Europe and the United States. On the other hand, the, there is uh, the following similarity. You see, you, you said that there, there's a great uh, polarization of society along religious lines. Now, that is true. The heartland is very religious in this country, and, and the coasts are relatively uh, they're more like Europe, to right. some extent, anyway. But, but the, the point is that the polarization also is an economic and a class polarization. And, and, you know, economists have really begun to study inequality now in, in depth. So Joseph Stieglitz, Piketty's book, which made such a splash. These have become real issues. And I don't think you can understand uh, the rise of these populists um, in these countries without under in, in Europe and here, without understanding how deep uh, the, the class divisions have become. Well, that seems right. Um, it, there is a puzzle, though, um, it seems to me, that um, certainly uh, the, econo the, 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 the economic um, dimensions that you were just mentioning look from the, from the perspective of an academic like myself and like, like you, the right tool to pick up to, to start analyzing and explaining. The additional puzzle, though, is that those... Um, uh, those economic features of the situation within the United States today are not are often not part of the explanation or not part of the narrative that the people who feel aggrieved, um, uh, the people who are expressing um, the need to take the country back or to um, identify who's you know who the the real Americans are and uh, who needs to to go or be prevented from coming. Um, that's not part of their narrative, right? Their narrative does look more overtly um, ethnic, religious, um, geographical. Um, now, w we as academics might think that those are proxies or the sort of epiphenomena of more fundamental um, uh, economic forces. You don't have to be a Marxist to think that kind of thought. Um, but um, do you think that there's some... Uh, explanation as to why the, 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 the economics of the situation are, are, are usually just are beneath the surface. Well, yeah, now, so let's take Brexit for a moment. Sure. Uh, all right, so, <clears throat> uh, and, and let's take what happened in Greece and, and with, Spodem, uh, with the rise of Podemos in Spain and so on. You see, imagine a working person or, <clears throat> or a workless person <clears throat> In, in the Thames estuary, uh, or, in, in, or in Madrid and Seville, or, or Crete, or Athens, um, such a person might, might ask, uh, might, might ponder what happened in Europe after the Second World War. And on, he might ponder what uh, the humane policies that were adopted by many European governments providing welfare and safety nets in housing, in education, 
and health. Uh, and he might ask, well, at what site did these humane policies get devised and implemented? And he would obviously answer at the site of the nation. He might scratch his head and ask, well, what supranational site has ever administered uh, safety nets and welfare in housing and education and health? In fact, he might say, I can't even imagine what a mechanism for welfare looks like at a supranational site. Hmm. Thank you. It has always been administered at the site of a nation. One doesn't even know how to begin to think about uh, how it would be dispensed at a supranational site. Those are very good questions, and they they define for me the good side of populism. And I think ordinary working people are asking questions like that now. They also go on uh, to ask. Uh, they also go on to, to to think of the supranational affiliation that uh, these countries have adopted uh, as giving rise to immigrant hordes who, who deprive them of their economic opportunities and who come and undermine their centuries-long uh, national culture of which they are so proud and so on. Now, now these further things that the, such a person might think over and above asking those excellent questions has no logical link with the excellent questions. And I think that making of an illogical, uncompulsory link between sound questions and unsound anxieties is the bad side of populism. And, and, and I think this is, it's a, this is an amalgam of sound and unsound thinking that it defines populism today. And now, the question you no doubt are, are, are keen to ask when I say this is, but why is this illogical and uncompulsory link? What is the compulsion to link it? That is everywhere present in, in, in Europe and, and in the United States as well. And here I think we simply must resist the temptation to blame the people. You see, uh, it's, it's very tempting to... When, when a bad result comes out of an election or a referendum, it's very tempting to blame the people as being racist <coughs> or, uh, or xenophobic. Uh, it, it, because after all, people are shaped by what they learn from the media, what, what they learn from the political establishment and the political class. Uh, let me just give you an example. It's not the extreme right which started saying horrid things about immigration in Britain. It was, the, just look at the Remain campaign by the British Prime Minister. It's Cameron who repeatedly wanted to own the immigration issue, take it away from the extreme right, and he said absolutely terrible things about immigration. Also, consider the fact that in the 2008 elections, Obama was much worse on immigration than McCain. And that's because he wanted to take away the immigration platform from the Republicans. So the entire political establishment has been terrible on immigration whenever it comes close to elections. And it's not just the extreme right. It's not just Trump. It was Obama in 2008. It was Cameron during the Remain campaign. And so if the whole political class and the tabloid and and media, uh, television media, and so on, that are constantly uh, shaping people's minds. I think you, there is a lot to to diagnose here, which comes from institutions of this kind and the whole political establishment, and and they shape the the uh, electorate's thinking. Um, you, you know, you can't believe in democracy and dismiss half the nation's electorate as as vile or stupid. It, it, that's not compatible with a belief in democracy. If you believe in democracy, you just can't do that because the electorate and the ordinary people are shaped by the knowledges they possess. And if, if they make this illogical link, it's there's something wrong in the public education that uh, 
is being provided by a whole range of institutions. That's what a Democrat has to say. A Democrat with a small d has to, has to say. And, you know, because for 20 hundred years, philosophers have said that the central ethical question is what ought we to do? But I think we live in such a complex time that the crucial prior question has to be what ought we to know? Excellent. That's completely compelling. Um, and I think that um, you're right uh, that um, the easy um, and blaming uh, responses to um, what many find is a very um, unsettling election result, uh, the, the, the blame the people for being um, xenophobic or ignorant or racist or worse um, uh, is too easy. Um but to pick up on the the the, 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 the what I think is a, a compelling sort of alternate to the how what we live, which is what ought we to learn or how what we what what do we need to know? Um, do you have any um, uh, sort of big picture lessons about how we might go about addressing that more pressing question as you just formulated it? Yes, yeah, sure. You know, <clears throat> there's there's this hysteria and hand wringing. Uh, with Trump's victory that I find amongst my colleagues and amongst my students, actually, and, and it's everywhere in the liberal press. But, but look, uh, uh, my, my view about what has to be done, it depends a little bit on how we understand what, what just happened. You see, I think, the hit, let's just take the, the last election. Hillary Clinton is about as establishment a political figure as you can find in the United States. Now, uh, the, the Democratic Party undermined the campaign of Bernie Sanders subtly at the beginning, and when he started really catching on in the, in the primaries, they did it quite openly. Now, there's this constant sneering about Sanders' populism, and I... Now, I don't deny for a moment that I think it goes without saying that Hillary Clinton would have been better than Trump. But if it goes without saying, don't say it. Because if you keep saying it, you're going to give rise to the complacence that the political establishment of which she's absolutely the, the center in, in this country, and what she represents, including her, her, uh, her, her husband, who was the, the former president, <clears throat> this is... Uh, you know, you, you've got to understand why people don't like the Clintons. Uh, you know, the, the, of course, it is false consciousness to say that that Trump is going to do something for the white working population, which is his constituency. But there was an, just as classic a case of false consciousness when when African Americans voted for Hillary Clinton rather than Sanders in the primaries. Bill Clinton was just about as the worst president in modern times for uh, if you consider the material interests of the blacks. He, he the notorious welfare bill, which is the anti-welfare bill that he introduced and passed, uh, is, is something that the blacks have never registered as, as a reason to, to vote against uh, Hillary Clinton. She has the same economic ideology as Bill Clinton. Sanders actually would have been much more, done much more uh, for their material interests. It's true that the Clintons are not so socially speaking racist, but the fact is that the African Americans would have been much better off under under uh, Sanders' policies than under uh, Hillary Clinton. So there's false consciousness everywhere. And, and I think that it would be a great mistake to 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 allow the fact that one thinks Clinton would have been better than Trump to become a form of complacence for, for doing nothing about, about the Democratic Party as it currently exists. The, the resistance to what happened, the resistance to, to, to Trump's presidency ought to be a way, ought to be a movement to steer the Democratic Party away from the classic establishment it has become under the Clintons. And and I think that ought to be the lesson we learn from Trump's victory. But I don't believe we learn it. I think the Democratic Party's uh, uh, learning curve is pretty much flat. And so it's it's not going to learn 
uh, this lesson. And you know, it's a, it's a it's a very simple thing to 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 uh, historically diagnose this. The the real victory of people like Reagan and Thatcher was not just that they introduced the right wing, but they made the left wing into center-right parties. Blair basically divorced the Labour Party from Labour, and and uh, Bill Clinton just basically divorced uh, the, the Democratic Party from its from its uh, sort of rainbow uh, uh, con constituency that it had for for years, all through the the Johnson era and so on. So so I think that if there's any lesson to be learned, it ought to be that we or to try and make the Democratic Party much less of an establishment party than it has been. But I don't think that the Democratic Party is it's, it's going to be an easy thing to do, because that party really, as I said, learns very little from elections in the last two or three decades. And do you think, um, what role do you think, um, or maybe the question is, how might we um, start uh, sort of approaching the what you identified earlier as the, um, the, 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 the invalid inference that's at the heart of, of pop, of populism. Um, uh, is there, is there any, any way that you could think of how, how that might be? It seems to me that's gotta be part of the, that's gotta be part of the puzzle, right? Remaking a party is, uh, seems to be, um, an important thing, but maybe not, uh, sufficient. Well, I mean, I think that it's 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 not sufficient. I agree with you, but but uh, but you know, there are just lots of different necessary things that have to be done, and uh, I don't think anything anybody can say what would be sufficient. Um, but but I you know I think there is real point to a lot of a, a lot of questions that are being asked about Brexit, about um, a whole range of of questions uh, that that uh, oppose the globalization of finance capital and the neoliberal policies that it entails, uh, and and I think what we need is and, and Sanders did his bit to to uh, bring that onto center stage, uh, and I think that. Uh, in Europe, there is uh, uh, an effort by uh, some parties to do that, but the point is that none of them re realize that you simply might have to think of Europe as some, something to break away from, uh, but you can't do that unless you really resolve to have a genuine left movement, uh, what was called Lexit. By, by a whole range of, of uh, leftist um, activists. And, and I think, it, and certainly from, for many parts of the world, such as the part of the world that I come from, it may be very important to, to de-link from the globalized uh, financial capital that really, in many ways, <clears throat> uh, destroys the sovereignties that nations have to control the future of their own economies. Look, take, take the fact <clears throat> that somebody like Lula was elected in Brazil um, with a very uh, humane and, and progressive political platform. He couldn't implement it at all. Hmm. Why? Why? Because of an anxiety about capital flight. That's what, what uh, a globalized finance uh, capital-based economy, uh, economy does, right? It allows capital to move out at the press of a button. That's something that was unleashed by the, the remantling of the Bretton Woods institutions uh, 30 years ago or more. And, and as a result, it's very difficult for, for national governments to, to do things for ordinary people in their country because of an anxiety about capital flight. Now, that anxiety can't can't be fought unless you de-link from the global economy. Right. And, and I think something like that is there in the urges of ordinary people in what I'm calling populism in the good sense. And I think we need political economists, politicians, activists, and so on to really think very hard about these issues.
Well, that's wonderful. Um, Akil, you've been uh, very generous with your time, and uh, I want to thank you once again for, um, for joining me on the Why We Argue podcast. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in to the Why We Argue podcast, which I remind you is produced by the University of Connecticut's Humility and Conviction in Public Life Project with generous support from the John Templeton Foundation. You can follow the project on Twitter and on Facebook at, at Public Humility. That's one word, Public Humility. Thank you so much, and bye for now. <laughs>